Hey everybody, how you doing? Mikey's back. Got a quick video. Well, I don't know how quick it's going to be. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I've uh, been a busy couple of days. Uh, work getting a little busy. By the time I get home, do my chores like a good little boy. Life gets in the way. Time for me to get some dinner and go to bed. Yeah. So anyway, let's rectify that right now. For those of you who are joining me, my name is Mike. i a former cigar smoker. Smoke cigars for 25 years. Uh, I still smoke the occasional cigar, but nowhere near as much as I was uh, at my peak. I was smoking two or three a day on the weekdays. On the weekends, I was doing anywhere between two and six. So, yeah, I like my stogies. Uh, it was getting a bit expensive and kind of lonely. Cigar smoking kind of a social thing, and I don't have any cigar buddies where I live. So, I switched to snooze and snuff. And then I wandered into the dip and chew world, and that's where I am. A lot of these videos, it'll be my first time with a particular product, and that's what we're running into right now. Red Seal Wintergreen Long Cut. My very first time with this product. Um, the only other Red Seal I have tried is their Natural, which I enjoyed quite a bit. Had good flavor. And 100% American Tobacco. And this is made by Smokeless Tobacco Company, same company that makes Copenhagen, Skoll, and Husky. So, the banding is a little tight right where the UPC flaps over. It's cracked this bad boy open. Ooh, nice wintergreen aroma. There's a lid sampling of the cut there. Cut looks to be fairly consistent with this one. Kind of, eh, a little all over the place, but as far as a budget dip goes, it's got a pretty nice look to it. Getting a nice wintergreen aroma right off the can. It's It reminds me of Copenhagen wintergreen at the first sniff. There's the money shot. Show you what we're looking at. Moisture level's decent. Sticks to my finger. Let's get this party started. I just dropped some on the floor. I apologize. I'm going to have to speak to the janitor. Wow. Having a hard time getting a good pinch out of this. It's tight here in the can. It's really tight in the can right now. So trying to get a decent pinch without taking half the can. Yeah, that's an awful big pinch, but oh well. Got some on my shirt again. Got to look presentable for you guys. Don't want you thinking I'm a tobacco slob. Don't tell anybody. Sweet wintergreen right off the bat. Got some sweetness. Got some wintergreen flavor. As this juices up, we'll see what's going on. Very first impression in my mouth. This is pretty good. I wonder what it's going to be like after it sits there for a few minutes. Got a big honking pinch in my lip. I'm not quite used to big pinches like this. I like to be a little bit more on the dainty side with my pinches, but eh. it is what it is. Yeah, oh, as we're approaching the holidays, yeah. I manage a hardware store over in Coos Bay. It's the helpful place. That should help you. Uh, yeah, we're getting the last final ar stuff arranged for the big push for the holiday sales, and then we got the owner came up to visit this week, so I'm busy talking with him and picking his brain, getting all that stuff ready. I love, I love working retail in the holidays. I know it sounds weird, I've worked some of the big box stores during the holidays. They have yet to break my Christmas spirit, all right? I love Christmas. I love Thanksgiving. Re working retail in hell will never take that away from me. It's my favorite stinking time of the year. Yeah. 
But yeah, in my downtime, been reading some history. I like reading history. Um, I really like reading local history. Oh, man. This is a good wintergreen. So far, I'm impressed. Nice wintergreen. There's hardly any tingle from the wintergreen. But it's got good flavor, and it's got a decent amount of sweetness to kind of combat that wintergreen. Some dark fire tobacco coming through. I'm liking this. Yeah, one of the local history accounts I've been reading. Um, the very first settlement here on the southern Oregon coast was a small town called Port Orford. Um, the very first attempt to settle the area was in 1851. Uh, steamboat captain up in Portland recruited nine men to help make an established, you know, build an encampment, a fort, whatnot at the mouth of the river of the what would soon become the town of Port Orford. The man volunteered. They went down there. He dropped them off. He's, he was going to go on to San Francisco, come back in two weeks. He assured them that the natives were friendly. He traded with them before. Never a problem. So the guys, you know, Hit the beach, they had their encampment, they had some weapons with them, and they also had a small cannon that they took from the ship to fortify their encampment, just in case. And the captain was right. The natives were friendly. Until the natives realized that these guys weren't just visiting, they meant to stay. And the natives were like, no, 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 go away. So, needless to say, some arguing ensued. The local chief decided he wasn't going to have it. He's going to kick these guys out. They were in his neighborhood. He, he didn't mind trading with them if they were visiting. He didn't want them to live there. So, they came to... These guys had encamped on, on this big rock that kind of stuck out into the beach a little bit. The little trail leads up the rock, and there was a space up top. That's where they all were camping out. Natives came up that trail and confronted them about their intentions to stay. Somewhere in all the yelling and everything, somebody panicked and fired a shot. And then all hell broke loose. Depending on which account you read, um, some say the natives started it and the natives say the white guy started it. Nobody knows. Um, it was a tense moment somebody pulled the first trigger those guys pulled back into their encampment and one of them set off the cannon into the crowd of natives as they were running up the rock killed six or eight of them instantly wounded a few more the small battle ensued and now that to this day that place is called battle rock um it's actually a state park there if you're ever passing through port orford oregon on the southern oregon coast you can stop by Battle Rock State Park, and the rock is there. But anyway, these guys fought. Um, several natives were killed. A couple of the um, uh, would-be settlers were killed. The Indians pulled back, and somewhere through using sign language and stuff, they were able to parlay and make some peace with each other. And the guys convinced them, okay, when the steamboat captain comes back in 14 days, we're out of here. We're leaving, Okay. So the natives pulled back, left them alone for 14 days. Well, 14 days came and went, and the captain did not return. So the natives were like, oh, these guys are lying to us, those bastards. So by this time, not only were the local natives, but a couple of the neighborhood tribes, neighboring tribes, sent over some more guys to help kick these guys out. They came back up the rock. A second fight ensued. Shots were fired. A couple guys were killed on each side. And through the, they made, you know, as they were leaving, the natives were gathering up their dead and their wounded. And the chief walked out, kicked the body of one of the natives that had fallen, pointed at the body, pointed at them, turned around and walked away. And they were like, what? They went down after the coast was clear and looked. 
And it wasn't a native, it was a white guy dressed as a native. Many years later, they would discover that that guy was a Russian sailor who had been shipwrecked on the coast many years before, and then the natives took him in, and he lived among them as one of their own for only God knows how long. They buried their dead. They buried the uh, unknown at that time, the Russian sailor, on the beach. And then while the natives were camped out on the beach to the south, they made a break for it and headed north. The very next day, the steamship captain arrives. When he arrived, the tide had come in and come back out, and the body of the Russian sailor that they had buried floated up to the surface on top of the sand. He saw the body. He saw some of the you know indications there had been a battle, and he's like, oh, crap. These guys are dead, all of them, because he didn't see, he didn't know where they were. He sailed on up to Portland, reported that they were all dead. When, in fact, these guys were hoofing it as fast as they can north along the coast. They got as far as the Coquille River. That's the same river that flows right past this town I live in. Um, it, the river's half a mile away from my house. They get to the mouth of the Coquille River. They're on the south side, and on the north side, there are several hundred very upset natives who had gotten word that these guys were heading their way. And they made no bones about it that you guys try and cross this river, we will kill you. You know, get lost. So they headed upstream for a few miles, waited until the fo fog rolled in. They made a makeshift raft and made it as far as a small island in the middle of the river. And then they waited until dark and they went the rest of the way on the other side of the river and then they hightailed it out of there as fast as they could. These guys are cold, they're wet, some of them were wounded probably. They were starving because they left all their provisions behind when they got out of Dodge. It was a get out or die situation. They lived on berries and some mussels they gathered along the beach. And they finally made it to a settlement um, just south of what is present day Eugene. And when they got there, they were able to, you know, nurse their wounds, you know, get a hot meal. And then they made their way north up to Portland. When they got to Portland, people are like, we were told you were dead. <laughs> They've been missing for like two and a half, three weeks. So, yeah, it's an interesting story. Eventually, they were able to make peace with the natives and establish a settlement the proper way instead of just showing up at random and trying to establish a fort without asking proper permission first. So, eventually, they made some peace. They got a settlement started, and that is now the town of Port Orford, Oregon. But it did not start well. <clears throat> I'm digging this wintergreen. Enough of the history lesson. Back to the wintergreen. Now that it's juiced up properly, and I've been rambling. Sweet wintergreen, notes of dark fired tobacco. It's holding together extremely well, even with all my jabbering along about some local history. Now, you know, 175 years ago. I like this. This is a nice budget dip. Um, this cost me five and a half bucks, I think. Five and a half or six dollars in that range. It's a one and a half ounce can. It's slightly larger than your standard dip can. You know, going to the edge here. It, you know, Sticks out just a little bit bigger than what you got. Upcoming review. Spoiler alert. So you get one and a half ounces instead of the standard 1.2. 25% more. It's got good flavor. I'm going to finish this can. I know I can tell you that right now. Red Seal, their natural is the same way. Good flavor. For a budget dip, Red Seal... Red Seal's top tier of the budget dips are, you know, right up there. Cougar is pretty good as well. I really enjoyed the Cougar Wintergreen. They're natural. I don't know if I got a bad can or what, but the funky flavor just wasn't doing it for me. Um, there was something in the background that just wasn't vibing for me. But this stuff, their natural is good, and this Wintergreen, 
I dare say this wintergreen is even better than their natural. It's very reminiscent of Copenhagen, although I, I would dare say this has a little bit more sweetness than Copenhagen wintergreen. There's a little bit more sweet undertones going on in there. Now that it's juiced up real good, still releasing plenty of flavor, holds together, spits well. This is a solid wintergreen. If you've never tried Red Seal wintergreen, I strongly suggest you give it a shot. This is my first time with it. This will not be my last time with this. This is, this is, yeah. This might become one of my favorite wintergreens, one of my go-tos. Stoker's makes a good wintergreen for a budget dip, and this is really good as well. I had trouble getting the first pinch out of it because it's just, it's a very well packed, there's a lot of tobacco, they pack it in there well. Yeah, nicotine content on this, I'm feeling it, but it's not bowling me over. So it's a nice mid-range nicotine level, which right up my alley. I don't care for too much strong nicotines. I'm a moderate nicotine kind of guy. But yeah, if you can get your hands on this, it's well worth it. Sweet, wintergreen, dark fire tobacco, holds together well. You get more dip for your dollar. I can't complain at all. Solid product. Well done, Red Seal. Well done, U.S. Smokeless. Anyway, this is Mikey. This has been Red Seal Wintergreen and a brief discussion on local history in the establishment of the earliest settlement on the west coast, on the west southern, southwest coast of Oregon. Uh, yeah, if you're ever in the area, Port Orford's full of history. And the town of Brookings, a little bit farther south, uh, close to the California border. Another town with some interesting history. It's the... <coughs> <coughs> is the only... Um, it, that town, the area nearby, is the only part of the U.S. mainland, um, the lower 48 states, that has ever been bombed by the enemy during World War II. Um, a Japanese pilot managed to drop some bombs over the forest outside of Brookings, Oregon, back in World War II. Many years later, he went to Brookings. And as part of his apology, he was, you know, sorry for trying to bomb the forest. Their goal was to start forest fires. He gave the town his sword. So it's in the Brookings Library. If you're ever in Brookings, stop by the library and see the sword. It was given to them probably in the 50s or 60s, by the Japanese pilot who bombed the forest outside of Brookings, Oregon. Interesting bit of history. Red Seal Wintergreen, check it out if you haven't already. This is Mikey. Sorry for being long-winded. I'll catch you all later. I'll be back probably tomorrow with another review. Catch you later.